Welcome everyone to the Damage Report. We've got a doozy of a show for you. Lots to talk about. Very excited to be joined once again on the show. Viviana V. Hill joins us once again. Viviana, how's it going? I'm great, glad to be back. Lots to talk about, you're definitely right. It's been a busy yes. week and it's Tuesday. So. You know, I, I should have clarified this before the show. I don't want to do any spoilers. The thing we were talking about, is that a thing to be talked about and announced or like later? I think so, but maybe not yet. Okay, well then we'll but, just tease that. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> But anyway, we had an opportunity to plug something. So I do want to plug it. Where can people watch your work until we announce whatever's being announced? There will be, I, I will be working um, with the Young Turks. You'll see some Facebook videos coming in the future. Uh, until then, you can catch me always on Twitter, on Instagram, and on YouTube um, with my own show, Contextualize This. But there will be more to come. And I hope next time I'm on the show, John, we can talk about it more. <laughs> awesome. That sounds good. Thank you. Um, and next time I'll check beforehand. But anyway, uh, thank you to everybody <laughs> who's already here trying to figure out what is actually going on. Uh, we appreciate you being here. Please uh, hit the like button if you haven't already. Share the stream so that people know we're live. And uh, as we go through a big hour of news, um, if you leave us comments, super chats, uh, tweets, twitchies, things like that, we're gonna be responding to those. Um, with that said, Viviana, you ready to do this? I'm so ready. Okay. <clears throat> Last night, Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez did one of her big Instagram lives. And this was a major one that is driving a lot of political conversation both last night and throughout today, where she revealed quite a bit. Her own personal history as a survivor of sexual assault, the experience of the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And we wanna play some highlights from this. Understand that is the topic matter. It is both graphic and potentially triggering. So. Understand that as we move into these videos, but first, here's uh, the representative. So many of the people who helped perpetrate and who take responsibility for what happened in the Capitol are trying to tell us all to move on. And they're trying to tell us to forget about what happened. They're trying to tell us that it wasn't a big deal. They're trying to tell us to move on without any accountability, without any truth telling, or without actually confronting the extreme damage, physical harm, loss of life, and trauma that was inflicted on not just me as a person, not just other people as, as individuals, but as on all of us as a collective and on many other people. And that, that we cannot move on without accountability. We cannot heal without accountability. And so all of these people um, who want to tell us to move on are doing so at their own convenience. Yeah, at the very least. And so um, we, we have a lot of videos we're gonna play and I have a lot of thoughts, but Viviana wanted to give you the chance to, to start us off. Yeah, it was a long video as is in AOC's true nature. I love her lives, she's so real. She's such a good example of the kind of leadership we need in this country to connect with the people. Um, I cried, John, I, I, I cried. AOC means a lot to me. I know she means a lot to people. Um, she represents a hope that we have in this country for democracy for uh, the working class, for, for you know people everywhere. Really the backbone of this country. That is what people like Bernie are fighting for. Uh, and of course, people like AOC. And let me remind everybody, this is a 31 year old woman. She turned 31 in November, I believe, or October, just a few months ago. And this is a young woman who is putting everything on the line to fight for the people of this country. Her tale was so traumatizing to listen to, and I'm so glad that she shared it. You know, it's upsetting to see a lot of the people talking about how dramatic she is and this and that, and trying to downplay exactly what she's talking about, gaslighting her in her own experience. And this is what colonization does to people who have been traumatized. This is what, you know, as a, a Latina, as a person of color, we are used to this. We continue continue to be traumatized when every single insurgent that is not held accountable for their actions, we get traumatized again because people are able to hurt us without accountability. 
So her coming from the heart and speaking to everybody, I mean, and even sharing. And if you if you didn't watch the whole thing, you might have you might have missed that sexual assault survivor bit because she kind of slipped it in there at the end when she's talking about compounding traumas. And yeah. what she went through that day is just, I can't even imagine. I would be absolutely devastated if if she had been assassinated. I, I, you know, we have I'm seen definitely. so many yeah. of our leaders, civil rights leaders, and and I'm not likening her to the level of Malcolm X or the level of MLK or the level of Robert Kennedy, but it would have been heavy like that for me. She still has some work to do to get you know into some of those places, but I see her trajectory following right. along some of these great leaders, and to see her life cut so short, and to see her, that's what made me choke up. I choke up now. To see her ready to do it, John. To see her ready to give her life, and just say I, I done what I can, and the rest of you guys carry the torch. This is what Bernie's slogan of "Yes, we can" means. Mm -hmm. We work together. It isn't about her. It isn't about her political career, although she will have one. And it's not not about her political career, and she's entitled to have a political career. But this is about all of us working together, and to see somebody who is putting everything on the line. To feel what they were going through, and she's an amazing storyteller. It, it just was very moving. Uh, I'm sorry, I got a little verklempt. <laughs> it was no, I, it's uh, certainly understandable. Um, yeah, and and look, some of the things you referenced, we are going to be playing excerpts from that. Um, and so I certainly have thoughts uh, both to what she said and some of the response to it from the literal scummiest scum of the entire earth. But um, what she said there about the people who want us to move on, um, unfortunately, we have language filters. On the program, so I can't say exactly what I actually think about that, but I think that you can probably fill in the blanks. Mother um, scratchers. If I spend months to hire a hitman to kill someone, and then the person goes and fails, and then I say, "You guys are getting so hung up on the hitman, seriously, just move on." No, no, no. no what normally happens in this situation is the Dems would be the one that that would be targeted by this, and then tell us to move on, and we'd be frustrated by that. But at least they were the victims. The people who were calling for this, spending all the time on their shows, Tucker Carlson's trying to pretend that it was nothing. Suddenly, mm -hmm. a cop being bludgeoned to death doesn't matter. Uh, no, you wanted this to happen. And by the way, if those people had gone in and had killed AOC and had killed Ilhan Omar and had gunned down tons of people, and the Republicans had just taken permanent control of US government, Tucker Carlson would be perfectly happy with that. Every single person saying it wasn't that bad, it wasn't insurrections, not white supremacists, why are you getting so worked up? It's not terror. Every one of those was sitting on that day. And I remember all of us are watching this. You know what your experience was like. And they were hopeful. They were hopeful that this would accomplish the goals that they had. And it didn't. They failed. They were losers. And they don't get to tell us to just move on. There should be no consequences. That we should mock the people who narrowly escaped with their lives. But anyway, there is a lot in here, so I do I do want to move on. As we talked about, AOC did reveal on this Instagram Live um, that part of the trauma that she's talking about is her having survived sexual assault. So let's go to that section now. Folks who tell us to move on, that it's not a big deal, that we should forget what's happened, or even telling us to apologize, um, these are the same tactics of abusers. And um, I'm a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and I haven't told many people that in my life. Um, but when we go through trauma, trauma compounds on each other. And so whether you had a negligent or you know a neglectful parent and or whether you had someone who was verbally abusive to you, um, whether you are a survivor of abuse, um, whether you experience any sort of trauma. Yeah, look, I mean, you can't listen to it and not just feel so terrible. Well, I should say rational people, people with actual hearts can't listen to that and not be just devastated by it. Um, some people can work through that. And while I, I like to think that my political value system is based on 
uh, positive values, positive emotions, a desire for progress and want to better the lives of others. I don't generally found my political beliefs in um, resentment or vilification or rage and that sort of thing. The disdain I have for the people who watched that or didn't even care to watch it, just knew that she had said that and thought, I don't even care enough about this experience to view it. I'm just gonna judge it and I'm gonna attack it so that I can get a couple of Patreon followers or something like that. I cannot explain the disdain I have for those people and how personally sickening and soiling it feels to even be engaged in this gigantic shared project with people who have those motivations. Like we occasionally have to be reminded that they're out there and that they're ostensibly doing something like us. But it is just so sickening. The people who have who have tried to make fortunes off of vilifying her and not just AOC, but others as well, Rashida Tlaib and Anna Presley and Ilhan Omar and a number of others, just the constant vilification for almost exclusively white male profit is disgusting. And and days like that, I hate everything about this. Knowing that she's revealing what she's experienced and it's devastating, and that she knows that it's not going away. It's not gonna get better. She's gonna be facing those threats and the harassment and the demonization tomorrow and next week and next year as much as she has up until this point. And it just, it makes me so sick. It makes me so, feel so bad for her and for others. And for, for other women like her that might be thinking about getting involved in politics, knowing that this is one of the totally needless additional costs that they're gonna bear. It just makes me sick for the present, it makes me sick for the future. You know, John, um, I'm with you. It's it's very upsetting. I I am lucky, I guess. I, I've been trained a little bit. You know, I used to be a, a children's social worker, and it, it it isn't lost on me that AOC disclosed her sexual assault uh, during this disclosure of what happened to her, because when you are vulnerable. And when you are, when your life is flashing before your eyes, all of these other things come back to you. And it's very upsetting to see sexual assault be um, discounted. We saw it with Brock Turner, we saw it with one of our own Supreme Court justices. Well, it wasn't that bad. Well, it was date rape. Well, it was this, I mean, molestation of children. When I was a social worker, we'd have kids, their own fathers molest them and be told, well, I didn't have sex with you just fondled you. So this whole dismissive behavior is abusive, it is traumatic. And like I said, it isn't lost on me that she's correlating these things because it brings up the same feelings. Yeah. And the good news here is talking about it starts the healing process. The good news is calling it out for what it is starts to break it down. Mm -hmm. So no longer are families so quiet anymore when there's molestation by that uncle. You know, years ago in my family, there was molestation things. People, shh, don't call the cops, don't do this and that. That's changing now, and it's because of strength of people like AOC. And it's because of strength of children who come forward and disclose that they've been touched, they've been this or that. And and I know we're talking about sexual abuse, and then we're talking about, you know, uh, the insurgents on the, you know, raiding the Capitol. And it seems like they're two different things, but it really is a violation of trust, respect, honor, dignity. And, and when you are have a history of that, not just her history as a, a sexual abuse survivor, but also her history as a woman of color in a system that continually discounts her experience. So this is something that it, you know. It was a very moving uh, video for me to watch, just because she's an amazing storyteller, and and people want to liken that to be her her being dramatic. This is a time where we need good storytellers. We need someone to set the stage because we were watching it in yeah. like we couldn't even believe our eyes. Now that I know what was going on inside, and each member has their own story of what they experienced because it was chaos. You know, your your wife and I, Arlene and I did a, a live on Instagram right the day after the insurrection. Insurrection on the 7th, and I said then, it's an inside job. It was obvious it was an inside job. It was obvious that they had planned to allow these people to get into the Capitol. Why? I used to be on all kinds of movie carpets, John, and they had better security there. I used yep. to interview stars on the carpet. They have those little cattle grates, but they have like 
three different ways to get in, cops, all you can't even get onto a red carpet, but you can walk onto the steps of Congress. You can get on those Capitol steps, even on a regular day. When it's a full session, this was planned and it was allowed. So anybody who wants to go out there and talk about how she's being dramatic, I want to know why the rest of them aren't being dramatic. Our Capitol was sieged. They tried to get in there, they tried to do, they were just a bunch of idiots. They didn't accomplish anything. Like you said, they're failures, they're losers. Exactly. But they still did some damage emotionally and physically. And we are not gonna sit back. We're not gonna let the Democrats sit back and pretend that didn't happen. We're not gonna let them use this for political power either. We're gonna call it for what it is. And thank God for AOC, thank God she's okay. I would have even been upset if Mike Pence got hurt. Of I, I would, I mean, obviously, I don't, but it's, it's it, because an attack on any of our elected leaders is attack on us. We have yeah. to honor that we have a system in place, no matter what side of the aisle you stand on. And it is so upsetting that we have people, Mike Pence's own party, they were gonna hang that man. Do not tell me for a second if they didn't run into AOC that they wouldn't have hurt her. Do not tell me for a second they wouldn't have tried to hurt her. Nobody I mean, actually are. believes that. Some people will say it, they don't actually believe it. And they're the same people that, as you point out, are calling her dramatic. Mm-hmm. Um, and AOC, I'm sure, has had to process that. There is no correct way to do this. If you don't talk about it, they pretend it doesn't exist. If you wait too long to talk about it, then how bad could it have been? If you talk about it coldly and just based on the facts, then it must not have been that bad. If you talk about it and make it real, well, then you're just being dramatic. There is no appropriate way to talk about something that they fundamentally don't care about and don't want to fix. But so there are, right there. there's a. There's a number of other videos and I wanna make sure that we get to as much of this. So um, here from the uh, IG Live last night, um, Representative Ocasio-Cortez is talking about um, abusers and about Ted Cruz, some of what's been going on recently there. Um, so when I see a party who cheered on violence, violence that killed five, maybe now six people, a second Capitol Police officer took their life in the aftermath of the attack um, this past week. When we are still losing people, um, when we don't know how many people are gonna develop PTSD after what happened, when we don't know how many people are still hospitalized. I mean, there are people who, sure, they may not have passed away, but they lost fingers, they lost eyes, um, and, These people are just trying to tell us it's not a big deal. And they're trying to say, you're making too big a deal over it. Or my favorite, um, this past week, Ted Cruz and now representatives Chip Roy and oh, by the way, some of the other representatives who actually encouraged people to threaten members of Congress or tweeted out the location of the speaker are now telling me to apologize for saying and speaking truth to what happened. These are the tactics of abusers or rather these are the Exactly, yeah, there's there's little as sickening as the idea that she's the one who's actually done something wrong. Um, And also revealing at the same time that they understand that they can ask for people to apologize or to give a statement uh, when it's not a member of their own party. Um, If it's something about you know revealing the abuse that you've suffered, then you're the bad person. If it's denying the existence of mass shootings, well, you know, I just I don't really want to talk about that. But anyway, um, I, I do want to go to another sort of related video, and then then we'll have a chance to to comment. Here she is talking about. Um, the, the situation. See this happen, how I feel and how I felt was not again. I'm not gonna let this happen again. I'm not gonna let it happen to me again. I'm not gonna let it happen to the other people who've been victimized by this situation again. And I'm not letting gonna let this happen to our country ever. I'm not gonna let it happen. And that should be the goal for everyone. And I don't know exactly what needs to be done to make sure that it doesn't happen again. But I know that just pretending it didn't happen and having no consequences for anyone who incited it or aided it. I don't think that's gonna accomplish that. So we're gonna try something. Viviana, what do you think? 
Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm right with her. We cannot let this happen again. We have to get people on both sides of the aisle to admit and, and acknowledge how incredibly serious this was. And you know, we're not seeing it even with how these you know insurgents are being or treasonous. I don't even know what to call them anymore. They, they, insurgents is almost too good of a name for these people. You know, they are, and and I'm going to be doing a video about this soon, John. Um, but I'm likening them to gang gang affiliations. And when you're here in Los Angeles, my dad's done a lot of work with gangs, and he works as an expert witness from time to time. And let's say you're 14 years old and you jump into a car. And your cousin is gonna go do a drive by and you have no idea your cousin's gonna do a drive by. But you've been jumped into the gang, you got your little tattoo two weeks before, you're in the car, you're just there. They go, they drew, do a drive by, they shoot someone, they kill someone. That 14 year old gets life for just being there. And you're gonna tell me that these insurgents get to skate free and get to ask for trips to Mexico and organic food and all this, sorry, all this bail. You know, money that's just easy to, they just come right out. No, we need to, this kind of thing. This is the trauma she's talking about. Holding those people accountable and holding our leaders like Cruz and Holly accountable is how we stop this from happening again. And that's not happening right now. And that's what everybody, and including the Biden administration, they're trying to be real soft shoed with this. They need to come on heavy. This is an assault on our, on our own soil by our own people. There's nothing more serious than that. They seem to be taking it seriously. I mean, look, Biden hasn't really gotten involved in much of this, which is frustrating. Anyway, um, there, there's one other area that I do want to talk about. Um, what, one of the most dramatic parts, one of the most dramatic parts of uh, AOC's Instagram Live last night was when she talked about the actual experience of what happened on the sixth. And so here's a section of that. Why is that it's too late? That it's too late for me to get into the closet. And so I try to kind of, I go back in and I, I hide back in, um, in the bathroom behind the door. And then I just start to hear these yells of, where is she? Where is she? And I just thought to myself, they got inside. And so I hide behind my door like this, like I'm here and the bathroom door starts going like this, like the bathroom door is behind me or rather in front of me. And I'm like this and the door hinges right here. And I just hear, where is she? Where is she? And um, this was the moment where I thought everything was over. Um, and the weird thing about moments like these is that you lose all sense of time. Um, in retrospect, um, maybe it was four seconds, maybe it was five seconds, maybe it was 10 seconds, maybe it was one second, I don't know. It felt like my brain was able to have so many thoughts in that moment um, between these screams and these yells of where is she, where is she? And so I go down and I just, I mean, I thought I was going to die. It's just absolutely devastating. Um, and we, we've talked about the fact that, you know, if someone had actually felt like every, there isn't a person in that crowd that hasn't been ritual, ritualistically like whipped into a frenzy on a nightly basis about AOC or about Ilhan Omar or about these other women that they've been trained to loathe. John, and Democrats hate her. Democrats hate AOC. Yeah. And Congressman Omar. I mean, Congresswoman Omar. They, she is having so much attention on her, and she was talking about it in this video, even preceding the sixth on Monday and on Tuesday, and the kind of feeling that she was getting in the community just with these people being in town, and then you know taunting her, her just feet from her car. I mean, there was no protection for her or for any of other of our, our other leaders that were there in Congress from this violent mob. You know, it's it's yeah. 
it, it, it is heart wrenching. You know, she hid in Representative Porter's office, and you know, and even acknowledged she like thought maybe she's safer in like a white lady's office, John. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's you know, why don't we actually have a little bit of that? Why, why don't we show that and then we can we can talk about Porter's involvement. First, she, you know, she saw me, um, she, and we waved. I went into my office, and a couple seconds later, she knocked and she said, "You know, could we, could we come in?" And I said, "Of course." Um, and she began to, uh, you know, her staffer was trying to describe what had happened. And Alex is is really usually like unfailingly polite um, and very personable, and she wasn't even really talking to me. She was opening up doors, and and I was like, "Can I help you?" Like, what are you looking for? And she said, I'm looking for where I'm going to hide. And the thing that will always stay with me, the two memories that really, you know, especially as a mom, I think were just really powerful for me was when she said, you know, I I was saying, well, don't worry, I'm a mom, I'm calm. I've got everything here we need. We could live for like a month in this office. And she said, I just hope I get to be a mom. I hope I don't die today. Viviana? I mean, that just got to hit you in the gut, right? That's just got to hit you in the gut. Not only do I want AOC to be mom, I, I want her to be the president. We need this lady alive. We need her, you know, out with the people. Where was she the day of the inauguration? She was out with her constituents fighting for a dollar raise out for, for grocery workers in her community. You know, also she was feeling a threat on her life, so she wasn't trying to go back around these people. I mean, yeah. I, this is not the first time a government has had people like Holly and Cruz who are willing to hurt other members of government for political gain. This is not the first time that this has happened. I mean, there's a whole play about it. And I don't know if you've seen it from Lin Manuel Miranda. It's called Hamilton. A dude was shot. I don't know if you know this, John, but this I've, happens. I've seen that one. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> this happens, and you know we need to take this seriously. I don't know why the gaslighting is just. Maybe we're all just so conditioned and we're okay with it. You know, Tucker Carlson, especially, he's been saying it since the seventh of January that this is no big deal, and playing it down since then. It is despicable. It's disgusting. It's un-American, and you never hear me say that. It's un-American, and it's not democratic. I mean, we this is something that we all have to take really seriously. I I love that she went and found solace with Representative Porter. Yep. I hate that, and she wasn't willing to go and meet with the other Congress people and the other members because they were all meeting in one extraction point. She describes in the video, John, and and she was afraid still, and I don't blame her for one. You know, if this was an inside job, which it does feel like, and she was already, you know, getting that premonition before Wednesday even came, that things were not being held, you know, the 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 crowd wasn't being held at bay. This ain't over. This ain't over. And you know, once again, we applaud AOC for her strength. Yeah, I I I like when she went out, you know, uh you're picketing, like she's gotta be worried constantly. Like she's not safer in New York, campaigning, going door to door, walking around the Capitol. And if something happens million- to her, Tucker Carlson is need to he's going to need to be sued because he incited. No, her. Tucker Carlson is going to talk about how uh, it had nothing to do with him, and these are good patriots. And why are you so focused on it? Like if 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 and, and like I can't even say if people have been killed in the six because they did kill people. They beat a cop they did down kill with a fire extinguisher. If they had killed more people. Fox would have run even more interference for them. It since the sixth, it's been uh, we're we're totally for peace, and it wasn't that bad. Why are you so focusing on it? I have family uh, members saying it was just a few knuckleheads, John. Just a few knuckleheads killing cops. Did you see the the? I mean, you could see people's bodies as the footage has come out. It's horrific. It's like wartime. What in I, the world are we just sweeping this under the rug for? And. So all those videos that we just showed, especially the last two of her talking about hiding, I want to I want to read, and I don't want to get into too much of a conversation about her because unfortunately we're going to talk about her later on. But I want to read a couple of quotes from February 2019 before a different storming of the Capitol. This was for the Fund the Wall March, organized in part by then she hadn't yet announced she'd be running for Congress, but Marjorie Green, and she said this about the effort to flood the Capitol in her words. They are nothing and they should fear us. They should be cowering in fear. And you know what? If you show up in big numbers on February 23rd, oh, I promise you, I promise you, 
they'll be struck with fear on the inside. All of us together, when we rise up, we can end all of this. We can end it. We can do it peacefully. We can. I hope we don't have to do it the other way. I hope not. But we should feel like we will if we have to, because we are the American people. So between when she helped to organize that first invasion of the Capitol, to the second one, when she was on the inside laughing at the people who were worried about catching COVID in tight quarters because idiots like her wouldn't put on a mask. Um, she like exactly predicted what she wanted to see and they got it. Some people were killed, representatives were fearing for their lives. Mike Pence could have been torn apart by a mob. And she is she's more like excited and thrilled with herself than ever following that. You know, we got sick people in government. We got sick, sick people in government. She, we do. We always have, John, but we do. We continue to. Um, yep. Yeah, I mean, we, there's a lot to say about Marjorie, Miss Marjorie, with her, with her bad blonde dye job with poor. It's Jeez. very dry. Her hair. Hey. God, anyway, uh, you know, obviously feel terrible for AOC as well as many others um, who went. You know, I feel that. I, I, I honestly I feel good right now, John. After hearing AOC's uh, story, she makes me feel strong. Her strength makes me feel strong. It makes me feel like you know what? This is all we have to do. We have to get up. We have to dust ourselves off, and we have to say what is happening, the truth, the facts, and we need to keep moving forward. And so I am invigorated by her disclosure last night. Um, you know, I, I know a lot of uh, sexual abuse um, survivors. I'm a domestic violence survivor. Violence against women is super common. Out of like five women, three or four have been assaulted in some way. So I'm not shocked to hear her disclose, but I am invigorated by her strength. And I know that we can get through this if we all come together and we continue to speak out against this kind of ridiculous behavior. Exactly. Yeah, and, th- and thankfully she's she is forcing that to be a conversation that everyone is yeah. going to have to engage in, and some people are going to reveal themselves. In uh, and she knows, and she knows she was going to be attacked. She knows she was going to yeah. be attacked after that story. That's where she waited, and she even said, "I waited to give them a chance to say, you know what, this is wrong," and that way she didn't have to lay everybody on the line. But she's not wrong. They did try to kill her. They were trying to kill Mike Pence. This is something that really could have happened, and I'm super glad it didn't. But let us not disregard. Like if people had gotten into your house, John, and started busting things around, and where she at? You know, she, who knows if that Capitol Police officer was doing a half-assed job? I don't know. I think they cut all the numbers of the staff that day. Yeah. I mean, there's been memos going around and whatnot. Exactly. Seen. Yeah, and just look, not nobody in the audience needs to be told that they're not the the people we're disagreeing with aren't engaging in good faith. But I just want you to bear in mind that the the mob that broke into the Capitol and killed people, they are obviously significantly, demonstrably less concerned about that than the threat that was posed to those two gun wielding white people when peaceful protesters were marching down the street near their house. (laughs) Like they did a month of coverage about those people (laughs) and how, oh my God, they were almost killed. Nobody even came near them. Nobody wanted no to. One Nobody's is, interested. No, anyway, he was these even aren't serious at people. Him. These aren't honest people. They're just not. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media, and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies, debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of Un the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. 
So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. The Senate trial for Donald Trump is set to begin in around a week. And I am starting to wonder what some prominent Republicans think a trial actually is. Because some of the things they're warning us against sound like the very point of having this at all. So here is Lindsey Graham, who apparently doesn't want witnesses. He doesn't want nothing going on this trial. Here he is. Well, we've only got a couple of seconds, but let me ask you, do you anticipate witnesses being called and then being cross-examined? I hope not. They didn't call any in the house. I think we know what happened that day. But if you open up that can of worms, we'll want the FBI to come in and tell us about how people actually pre-planned these attacks and what happened with the security footprint at the Capitol. You open up Pandora's box. If you call one witness, I hope we don't call any and we vote and get this trial over uh, next week when it starts. And just really fast in case people aren't sure. He doesn't mean that Trump's guilt is so obvious that we don't need to go through a big thing. We could just vote to convict him. He doesn't want there to be any consequences. So it's not just an expedited trial. He doesn't want anything to happen. He just wants to move on, forget it happened. And in the future, if you wanna call for some sort of violent insurrection, you will be pretty assured that there will be no consequences for you if it fails. So I have more thoughts about that, but Viviana, what'd you think about the, uh, let's just get it done in one day, no witnesses, nothing. I'm glad you broke that down for me because I wasn't quite sure what side of the fence Lindsey Graham was on today. He seems to be blown left and right, whichever the wind is blowing, he decides he wants to go. This guy is so spineless, like, when is he out of office, honestly? Because this guy does not need to be representing anybody, he has no backbone at all. Um, of course, they don't want a trial, but guess what? He was scared when people were shouting at him in the in the airport. He was yep. a little bit frightened. Matt, those are the same people, my friend. Don't you want to see those people accountable for what they did? Don't you want to make sure that they don't do it again? Frankly, I think a lot of them do need mental health mental health help. Uh, many of their their legal cases are are based on the fact that they are crazy. That's what their own attorneys are saying, so, and I do think that a lot of these. People who were there at the Capitol have violent tendencies. I mean, we've seen some of these guys in the very beginning that breached that first. I don't even want to say they breached it. Essentially, the cops were like, okay, you know, let them in. But they were violent. You could feel it. In the, you could just in the video. Can you even imagine in, in person? When we've seen more and more of these things come forward, uh, I'm not surprised that they don't want to have witnesses because stuff is. Scary, and people are going to start telling stories like AOC. It's going to really get real. And a lot of the people that yeah. were there on the floor, they did see a lot of stuff firsthand. So you don't need a lot of witnesses. But we do want to hear from the FBI. We do want to hear what was planned before. There are a lot of people that orchestrated this event. Let us not forget that Trump, who never misses his own party, left his own party to be in DC on January 6th to watch this melee happen in real time. Yeah. Yeah, they knew it was happening. Like, I get that you don't want witnesses, Lindsey Graham. I get that, but you're gonna have to come up with a better argument for why we shouldn't have witnesses. Like, you could be honest and say it's gonna make us look really, really bad. But you saying, now, come on, if we have witnesses, it's gonna open up Pandora's box, and I define Pandora's box as bringing in the FBI to like talk about how it was planned and the security footprint. I think the expression is don't threaten me with a good time. Yeah, no, that's what we want. That's the entire thing that we want. We wanna know what went into the planning. We yeah. wanna know why no one was actually there. These are very important questions we need answered. And you think that's like the dark consequence of this impeachment trial that we might find out more about it? He doesn't yeah. care about that and he doesn't wanna know. Even though he was again, one of those who theoretically could have been targeted for not being sufficiently loyal to the president. Yeah, no, I want that. I want the witnesses. I want to find out exactly what was going on. That's kind of the entire point. But Lindsey Graham's yeah. a senator. You know, like who am I to teach him what the purpose of an impeachment well, trial is? You have a lot more knowledge than him, I can guarantee you on that. But you know who I was really disappointed in was a James Comey because he was one that also said that he did not think there should be a trial. And I don't really understand 
his his logic. And I'm going to go with Comey instead of Graham because I just think Graham's a complete moron and there's no point in even trying to make sense because this guy will, tomorrow will be something else. But Comey knows how dangerous Trump was, really warned everybody. Now this has happened and then still doesn't want a trial because he doesn't think that it's good for the American people. How is not having a trial good for the American people? How is sweeping this under the rug good for American people? I mean, I just don't, what do you think his basis is for that sort of thinking? I think it it's really inconvenient for them. I think that he has spent the last four years after he flipped from, you know, like being vigorously opposed to Donald Trump to, oh wait, that's my future career on the line. I guess I love him now. He's just been defending him. He's been running interference for him for four years, and he's gonna keep doing that because he thinks that he needs to. And he's not even a hundred percent wrong. If he were to demand an investigation and consequences, Trump would turn on him, and that probably would be a primary for him the next time. And so I can like have a little bit of empathy that I understand the situation, but I also get that what you're doing. And what you're doing is protecting the person who inspired a fascist attempted takeover of the government. So you kind of become my enemy at that point. But in that video, he did reveal something else. One interesting new legal theory that some prominent Republicans have in advance of the Senate impeachment trial is that, oh wait, it can't have been incitement because some people came to DC planning to do something. We showed a video of Lindsey Graham making that point. Here is Sean Hannity making a very similar argument. Uh, after you point out that what law enforcement and court documents say that it was pre-planned, so it wasn't a spontaneous it was something that had been planned ahead of time, couldn't have been incited by anybody. Um, if the Democrats want to go down this road of witnesses, and I hope they do. Okay, so he supposedly actually wants witnesses, but he doesn't, he doesn't want the trial at all. Um, so his <laughs> argument is that because some people came with pipe bombs, they already wanted to commit violence. So there couldn't have been any incitement or any culpability for Donald Trump. And we're gonna have some receipts on that. I would. I want to give Viviana a chance to cut in. I will just say that I think that that is on its face the dumbest thing I've ever heard. And I, I don't even know how he, with a straight face, could. What a weak shield for your God Emperor. Then, well, no, some of them are already really violent people that love the president. That's your defense for Trump. Interesting. They clearly yeah. all failed uh, their logic 101 class in college. I mean, those kind of arguments are just ridiculous and they don't hold any water. I mean, when you talk about inciting, it doesn't have to be in the heat of the moment. You can incite something and it can take time and it can take four years to get to where it went. And that's exactly what we've seen. So, he, you know, this is that logical fallacy that we we learned about when, you know, in, in our undergrad education. So it, it's, it's, for him to go that way, and this is, that's Tucker Carlson all day. The guy is full of logical mm -hmm. fallacy all day. You watch his show and it's just straw man, straw man, straw man, and people eat it up. you know. And, and that's how conspiracy theories get taken off and all this kind of stuff because people don't understand a good basis of a logical argument. And you know, we're seeing, we're seeing it right here. Well, how could it be this if it was this? Well, how could it be this if it was this? Well, it can be all things, sir. And if you have somebody for years saying, it's, I mean, Trump was inciting this before the election. He was already saying that the election was gonna be stolen if he didn't mm -hmm. win. And, and, and he yep. says it with a, with a laugh. Well, if I don't win, then it wasn't fair. I mean, it, it's like something a child in a schoolyard would say, but somehow we're taking it seriously. Like it makes no yep. sense. We know that he was lying, 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 lying. Here we are, we know we've come to this point. So for anybody to sit back and say, you know, oh, it wasn't incited by him because look at other people were, well, how did they get those ideas? They were literally carrying a flag with his name on it. Mm -hmm. Don't tell me he didn't incite it. Well, let, let's let's go over some of them, by the way. So let, let's skip past this next argument because Sean Hannity again tried to say that because someone brought pipe bombs, they couldn't have been incited by the president. Okay, well, Caesar Sayak sent pipe bombs to like everyone in media and that was directly incited by the president. We gave him, we gave him one massive incitement to violence free. But anyway, um, here are just a few of the things he said. I don't want to read 30 things, so we've culled down some, but there's a lot more available. Do you remember the period after the election? On December 12th, on the day of pro-Trump rallies in Washington, D.C., Trump tweeted, Wow, thousands of people forming in Washington for Stop the Steal. Didn't know about this, but I'll be seeing them. Then that same day he said, we have just begun to fight. 
On the 19th, he tweeted, tweeted his praise for a report by his advisor, Peter Navarro, alleging election fraud. A great report by Peter, statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election. Big protest in DC on January 6th, be there, will be wild. And it was, it did get pretty wild. If you think a wild time is beating a cop to death and trying to kill another one with an American flag. On December 26th, he tweeted, the Justice Department and the FBI have done nothing about the 2020 presidential election voter fraud. The biggest scam in our nation's history, despite overwhelming evidence. They should be ashamed, history will remember, never give up, see everyone in DC on January 6th. So this is almost two months after the election, he's still saying it was stolen. Everyone knows that it was stolen, the whole system is against you. Go to DC on the 6th, I'll see you there. On January yep. 1st, the big protest rally in Washington DC will take place at 11, stop the steal. And then on January 4th, two days before, if the liberal Democrats take the Senate and the White House, and they're not taking this White House, we're gonna fight like hell. I'll tell you right now, we're going to take it back. Well, they tried, they did try to take it back after Trump literally months saying. of being told it had been stolen and that they need to go there and they need to fight like hell and they need to stop the steal and they need to take it back. Yes, Sean Hannity, he did incite them on the 6th, but that wasn't the beginning of it. He'd been doing it for months and you know that already. The fact that you care more about protecting him than about the fact that someone brought freaking pipe bombs to the Capitol says a lot more about you than about the charges facing the president. Well, the charges could also be held on him as well because Tucker Carlson was right right, right there holding the president's hand as long saying the same exact thing, regurgitating it, Hannity, getting yeah. it out to these uh, Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson, all everybody on Fox, not everybody. I'll say not everybody. There were a few voices and they were like, "Well, I don't know. I still want to get paid though." And they still were doing their thing. But, you know, uh, Hannity, anybody perpetuating this lie is guilty of inciting this. Because people are in vulnerable places, they're weak minded people out there. They're very susceptible to this kind of manipulation. And that is what has happened. There's a lot of people who are angry and they're just a powder keg waiting for a match. And Trump was happy to give him that and he enjoyed watching it. And don't for a second think that he wouldn't have stayed in office if they would have successfully done something and, and stopped the count and convinced Mike Pence by force to not validate the election result, the electoral college. Don't think he wouldn't have been Putin, he would have done it. He looks up to the guy. No, oh, you're crazy. Sean Hannity would have been boycotting America if Trump <laughs> had remained president somehow, because he cares about democracy. Is not the time to count pennies. Now is the time to address these monumental crises. And I think what the president is proposing is a very good start in doing that. Um, what is your is Bernie Sanders last night talking about the still ongoing negotiations over a stimulus bill, which had an added wrinkle at the beginning of this week with 10 Republicans coming to Biden and saying, we wanna negotiate. Fortunately for them, we know a little bit about what they want. Here's a little visualization of the differences between Biden's plan and their plan. It's kind of a mess, but what you need to know is that there's fewer red squares and they're smaller. So huge portions of aid to state and local governments and all of that just don't exist in theirs. And the actual direct payments are far smaller, far more targeted. Basically everything is as scaled down as they think they can get away with. Um, and that is what they want to push on Biden. Biden, the guy who already went to $1,400 checks from $2,000 checks, I'm never gonna move on from that. Um, let alone more than that, they're saying, no, no, no. After our great leadership during the first year of this pandemic, we think you should go with our plan. Our plan that lost us the presidency, our approach to COVID that lost us the Senate. Um, we can't lose more than we've lost. And yet you should go with what we have to say. And so um, we're gonna talk a little bit about where this seems to be going. But Viviana, what do you think about the, the current state of this um, aid package uh, talk? I mean, thank God we have Bernie Sanders, right? I mean, geez, what an amazing angel he is. But uh, you're going from 170 billion for schools to 20 billion. Weren't these the same people demanding that schools stay open in the middle of the pandemic? Do they not see that it's gonna take major support to be able to get those schools in a safe place for our kids and our families and our teachers and our well, administrators? Viviana, that's, that's if you want it to be a safe place. If you oh. just want it to be <laughs> open, that's pretty cheap. <laughs> that's the problem. I noticed that there's no rental assistance in their package. 
These are people that are not taking into account. I mean, we live in Los Angeles, John, so we know how severe the homeless crisis yeah. is. And we know that without rental assistance, that that is going to explode. And a lot of times people think about others experiencing homelessness as adult men. Guess what? There are little kids out there that are experiencing homelessness too. They're not as visual yet. Take away that rental assistance, you're gonna start seeing it. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Now, um, I was very worried when I saw that Biden was going to be meeting with them to potentially negotiate. There was yeah. a little bit of sign that maybe he's not going to pull a you know first couple of years of Obama. Because um, yeah, I saw a tweet from Jeff Stein, White House has put out a statement saying they are not open to lowering the stimulus payments below $1,400 per person. Okay. Although as we've pointed out, they already well, lowered how did it. This, but, how did this even but, happen? But, but they're saying they're not gonna lower it beyond that. Um, but they might be willing to open uh, will open to changing the income thresholds. Which again, just makes me wanna rip out the little bit of hair that I have. But apparently they're at least drawing a line at where they retreated to, which is the $1,400 checks. And in terms of the overall, this stupid nonsense conversation that we're having about bipartisanship and unity, which Honestly, I blame Joe Biden for a lot of that because he does talk about it a lot. Yeah. Um, his chief of staff put out a tweet saying this is a bipartisan agenda, pointing to the fact that two thirds of Americans side with Joe Biden on COVID relief. And I wanna give you a few of those numbers to buttress Ronald Klain's point. 63% of people would like to see coronavirus aid pass as soon as possible. 72% of Democrats, 59% of independents, even 56% of Republicans, 55% of people would be fine with literally changing the rules of the Senate to get it passed as quickly as possible. Notably, the most important like priority for these people is not unity or bipartisanship. It turns out they would rather eat than not eat in a bipartisan fashion, weird. Yeah. But anyway, 79% of people support $1,400 stimulus checks, 77% feel the same about funding to help schools reopen. Other efforts, including an eviction moratorium, increased funding for vaccines and testing also had a majority of people's support. It is already bipartisan whether elected Republicans wanna recognize that or not. And I would say that maybe they could be a little bit more humble with their demands, considering that they have failed as epically as a party can, specifically because they're not doing anything about this and they spent almost a year not doing anything about this. That took the presidency from Donald Trump. He would have gotten reelected if he had even pretended to give half a damn about the pandemic. They pretended. would still control the Senate if they would pretended to care, give half a damn about it. They didn't do that, so they lost. How many ways do the American people need to show that they want something to be done? They've done it in every way imaginable. Now, hopefully the bill will actually get passed at long last. I'm really um, hopeful. You know, you said you were afraid when, when Biden met with these um, GOP members, but I really feel like uh, Biden's in the IDGAF club. You know, he's an older man. He's at the end of his political career. This is not gonna be an Obama administration. Obama still had a political agenda and a career and a sort of legacy to uphold. I, I I hope that Biden is just gonna try to do the right thing. Who cares? I'll just get it done. I'll just push it through. Cuz see, you know, I don't know he he owes he owes a lot of favors. That's the danger that I I'm afraid of. You know, Biden's been in politics his whole life and he you know he owes a lot of people back scratches. So we're going to see where that lays in here, but he in regards gives to a lot of unnecessary back scratches historically. Yeah. <laughs> well, 63% of people need aid, 79% of uh, people support the 1400 and 100% of the people of the 79% support $2,000 checks too. Nobody's going to be mad to get an extra $600 in that check, which I still haven't even gotten my last stimulus check. And I know a lot of Americans haven't, why? Because the exactly. post office is struggling still. So we are already, by the time we get that check, we're gonna be, it's gonna be June. And then they're gonna be like, oh, you're vaccinated. You don't need it anymore. I, I appreciate Biden letting them in the office and having a meeting with them. Why? Because we had four years with the president who didn't even consider that and didn't even do his job. He didn't do his work any at all. So that's good because that is gonna help you know, give this veil of unity at least. It makes me laugh that Fox News and all these GOP uh, people complain about Biden's unity plan. Like the guy is trying to do something here, give him a break. You're gonna get on him about unity? 
this is uh, it's going to be a bipartisan effort. Why? Because it's helping the whole country. That's why it's a bipartisan yeah. effort. Most it's of the people convenient. aren't Jeff Bezos last time I checked. So they're going to need this mm-hmm. support. Yeah, it's just they don't want anything to happen. And not wanting anything to happen is going to be flavored differently depending on the time. They think they can get a month or two out of, but you said unity to get nothing done. And then finally, eventually it's going to be six months of, but elections are coming, don't do anything. Right, and they'll right. find some other obstructive way to stop things from happening. I don't care about the sprinkles on top of your obstruction or your desire for gridlock because you fundamentally come from a political philosophy that feels like, hey, we're doing okay. We don't have any problems, so the government shouldn't function. Because if the government were to function and actually do things, they might have to raise taxes. That is the entirety of their political philosophy. I have no interest in that. I don't care about their PR attempts to, to dress it up. It's just it's disgusting, John, because their constituents need the help. This is a priority. Mm-hmm. This is urgent. And for them to be sitting on their laurel, laurels like this, it's really, really, really disgusting. Yeah, I agree. That's so why people hate politics is because of that kind of behavior. Yeah. Yeah, a government that never delivers is, I mean, they've found a sort of a way around that for some of their constituents. A lot of elected Republicans could use the the help, but have been trained to think that the only point of government is to troll liberals. I mean, that's or to yeah. you know, demonize the trans community or something. Like they found a way to channel people's anger into stuff that has literally nothing to do with the economics, but other people can see through that. Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's quickly move through into at least one more story just because I want to make sure that we get on a little bit of this because there's so much every day that develops from it. Hi, there we go, (laughs) nice. (laughs) We've been wondering, will any Republican say anything? We're not even expecting them to do anything, just say something about Marjorie Greene and her calls for the execution of her political opponents. All of that, and hey, we've got a little bit. Senate Minority Leader, that feels good to say. Mitch McConnell on Monday blasted Georgia GOP Representative Marjorie Greene's embrace of loony lies and conspiracy theories as a quote, cancer for the Republican Party. He goes on to say, somebody who suggested that perhaps no airplane hit the Pentagon on 9-11, that horrifying school shootings were pre-staged and that the Clintons crashed JFK Jr's airplane is I hadn't even heard about that one is not living in reality this has nothing to do with the challenges facing american families or the robust debates on substance that can strengthen our party that last bit is absolute nonsense he has no interest in any of that but he did call her someone who believes loony lies and conspiracy theories now before you give him even just a little bit a couple little nibbles of lettuce of credit He doesn't actually mention her by name, (laughs) but he is very specifically and obviously talking about her. So like for him to be the first one really to say anything is to like stick his neck out of his shell is a little bit of bravery. But he's also doing it in like, God, you you're doing that in a cowardly way. But but it's all that we've got. So I guess a little bit of credit for minority leader. Mitch McConnell, how sick must it make him not just to not be in charge anymore, but to have the word minority in his title? It must just make him sick to his little stomach. <laughs> John, did you say give him a bite of lettuce because he looks like a turtle? I didn't say that last part. I <laughs> you said give him a little bite of lettuce. <laughs> You know, he is a coward. Um, and it's so funny, right when you think he might step up and do the right thing. He doesn't. He does it like a half attempt to do it. And, you know, this woman was elected. Okay. That doesn't mean she needs to have any power and be given any prestigious positions. They should have known, the GOP should have seen this coming, should have seen that she was a Looney Tune coming through, coming into Congress. She, she got voted in in Georgia. Georgia is a very diverse state, we're finding out. And I think what's really, um, well, we'll get into a little bit more about the unnamed uh, person, Marjorie. But, you know, I, I'm not surprised that he's going to come forward. But what I really think is happening is the GOP is really lost right now. They don't know if they should be pandering to the Marjorie Taylor Greene types or are we done with her? Can we go back to old school Bush Republicans? Where are we at here? Uh, and they're still trying to figure out, and they want to see who who's uh, going to be carrying them across to the next political office that yeah. they want to hold. And so they're just throwing stuff out to the wind and seeing what what takes. 
McConnell was okay with uh, convicting Trump, saying it was his fault. Now he's not. Yep. So they want to they want to know what's going to get him elected, and that's disgusting. Right now, we need politicians and people in power. Our leaders need to be leaders. They need to do what's right by the country and right for their constituents. And somebody like Marjorie Taylor Greene is not good for the country. She's hurting yeah. people. We're having to have people relive the trauma of these school shootings just to prove that it happened. Talk about gaslighting. I mean, it's been yeah. years now. We only haven't had a school shooting recently because we haven't had school. Exactly, and they're trying to get them back in as soon as possible. Um, she did respond, tweeting, the real cancer for the Republican Party is weak Republicans who only know how to lose gracefully. This is why we are losing our country. So I, I wanna address quickly both, both of those parts because who only know how to lose gracefully. Okay, so you don't like Mitch McConnell. Um, I, I mean, I guess he won re-election, but who has been losing gracefully? Well, since 2016, uh, in 2016, they controlled the presidency, they controlled the Senate, they controlled the House. After four years of the man she worships as a living God being president, they don't have the White House, they don't have the Senate, they don't have the House. Um, he was the leader of the party. Any victories they got, they said were due to him, ipso facto, and Green, you can Google that. Um, theoretically, <laughs> the, the losses are on him as well. So, I mean, granted, it doesn't really apply to what she said because he's never done anything gracefully. He can't even drink a glass of water gracefully, let alone lose gracefully. But he did lose. Of course, she doesn't accept that. She lives in a world where everything is whatever you want it to be. So she still insists that Trump actually won by a landslide. But you'll note that he's not in office anywhere anymore, Marjorie. So while you might maintain that thought, it doesn't give him any actual power. So look, she's gonna respond. Being strong in the face of you know these inconvenient things like reality or how you raise money as a Republican, um, I hope I hope others will come out and support McConnell in this effort. I don't like any form of the Republican Party, but one that is just openly give us your flat earthers, give us your snake people, give us your whatever. I'm less interested in that one. I'm really afraid, actually, John, because I, I think people underestimate just how many people people believe in these Looney Tune conspiracy theories, like Marjorie Taylor Greene. Mm -hmm. For every Marjorie Taylor Greene, there's ten people that believe it, but they don't say anything on Facebook. They just read yeah. the 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 posts that she puts. They watch the video of her uh, bullying uh, Hogue or Hog. His name is Hog, the Parkland guy. They they. You know, I don't even I don't even understand the wildfire anti-Semitic. Really, I don't even understand what she's saying there. So that's but people mm -hmm. are reading this stuff, and you know, we know how these conspiracy theories take off. You know, they give them a little tidbit of truth. People go and they look it up. Oh, that was true. So then the rest must all be true. Mm -hmm. You know, and and so this is a really dangerous place for our country to be in because it's not just one Marjorie Taylor Greene. There's so many people like her out there, and we saw them right there storming the Capitol. And then for every person that was at the Capitol, there's 10 at home that were cheering them on. So this is something we need to take seriously. This is why Mitch McConnell needs to not take a, a half stab at it. He needs to come out, he needs to name it for what it was and do what AOC did. Call out the facts and the truth, and he's too afraid to do it. Why? Because he is trying to hold on to this, this vestige of power that he once had. And if yeah. she's if she thinks that Trump really won the election, then how do we know her election was real? Why is it that their election was real, but his wasn't? Uh, this is not adding up, people. No, maybe we need to have an, a new election for you, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Maybe we need to maybe we need to know if you really won. Let's hold a, a recall <laughs> election. And see. Maybe, maybe. Okay, there was a little bit more. We're gonna have to punt till tomorrow, but uh, Viviana. As always, thank you so much for joining us. Um, in the meantime, until you're back on, and until we can reveal, you know, secret projects and all that, uh, where can people see more of your content? You can uh, follow me on Twitter. I'll be uh, promoting a show that I do, contextualize this every Friday. Uh, every Friday, I do a Frisky Friday with a friend of mine, Arlene Santana. You might know her because she is I've your friend. You've met her a few times. Uh, you see her way more than me in COVID times. But yeah, check <laughs> us out on Instagram Live. That's Fridays around noon. And you can always catch my show again on YouTube as well. But there will be more coming soon. Stay tuned, you guys. I'm excited to share with you as soon as I get the, the green light. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on, John.
Very excited to be joined once again on the program by the host of the Tom Hartman program, as well as the author of the just released The Hidden History of American Oligarchy. Tom Hartman, welcome back to the Damage Report. Hey, John, it's great to be here with you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, always glad to have you here. Um, this is the latest in a series of books that you've written. Um, and if, if people are interested in seeing our talks on previous installments, um, we've, we've covered the last several. But this time you're taking on not guns or the Supreme Court, you're going for American oligarchy. It seems pretty relevant right now. Um, how did you choose the topic for this most recent book? Well, it's it's sort of the bookend. The last book that I wrote was the the hidden history of monopoly in the United States, mm -hmm. and monopoly is where economic power is concentrated in a very small number of hands, which is very much how our economy is run now. The political equivalent of monopoly is oligarchy, where political power is concentrated in a small number of hands, typically very very wealthy hands, and we also have that. And in fact, I would argue, as would Matthew Gillens and Benjamin Page of Princeton and Northwestern Universities, who did a study on this, that basically in the last 20 years or so, our form of government has morphed from small d democracy into oligarchy. They did this survey, which is fairly well known now, where they found that prior to the Reagan revolution, what the what public opinion polls showed the majority of Americans wanted as legislative policy actually happened. You know, Medicare, Medicaid, civil rights, voting rights, uh, long term unemployment insurance, clean up the air, clean up the water, uh, you know, all the control predatory corporations, have a good strong minimum wage. All that stuff in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s actually got made into law. And then Reagan came along and said, "Screw that! We're gonna we're gonna dance to the tune of the rich people." And in part because of a, a couple of Supreme Court decisions in '76 and '78 that legalized billionaires and corporations owning politicians. And, and so when you look at the exact same metrics in the 1990s, mid 1990s, right through today, their study was actually in 2014, but up to then, what they found was the probability of what average people want. Uh, you know, like over 70% of average people want being translated into legislation is roughly equivalent to random noise. There is no longer any correlation. <laughs> but what the top 3% want is routinely well over 50 or 60% routinely translated into legislation, whether it's Trump's tax cuts or whether it's the so called, uh, you know, uh, 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 penal system reform and judicial, you know, the, the uh, I forget the, the exact phrase that they used. You know, a criminal justice reform, I think it was, mm -hmm. which actually just in, you know incorporated this mens rea thing to make it harder to prosecute CEOs when their companies kill people. I mean, that was the essence of it. Yeah. So, uh, wow, it's a mess. Um, and and look, obviously, I, I want to talk about the current state, how we've got to here. But the 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 part that kind of surprises me a little bit is, so prior to the Reagan Revolution. Were the rich having a difficult time getting what they wanted out of politics? I, I mean, I get that it's getting worse, but it seems like why why was it more difficult for them then? I mean, many of our presidents and and elected officials themselves are are very wealthy. Um, were is it is it is it more of a thing where just the interests of the poor working class middle class are dropping off, or was it prior to there it actually difficult for the rich to get, for instance? decreases in taxes, those sorts of things. Right, it was a combination of law and societal norms. Um, you know, when Richard Nixon uh, uh, ran against Jack Kennedy and, and lost uh, back in 1960, um, and did his, you know, you won't have me to kick around anymore, uh, the, the infamous checkers speech. He, he pointed out that his wife doesn't own a fur coat, she wears a cloth coat. And the little dog that they have was given to them. In other words, he was saying, I'm not rich, I don't serve the rich. That was what people wanted from politicians is what they expected from politicians. The Tillman Act, which Teddy Roosevelt had passed in 1907, was still being aggressively enforced. It, it made it a federal felony for any person in any corporation on behalf of the corporation to give any money or other thing of value to any political campaign for federal office. And so you, know, you had law constraining giant corporations and the rich. As well as this cultural norm, plus the top tax rate 
when Nixon was around and throughout the Nixon administration, throughout the Ford administration, throughout the Carter administration, it was 91%. And that's why the average CEO prior to the 1980s took about at the maximum 30 times what their lowest paid employee did. Because beyond that, they'd move into a tax bracket where it was basically confiscatory. Um, so you know they left the money in their companies, they paid their people well. And also during that period from 1940 until 1982, the middle class was growing faster in terms of both wealth and the, you know the accumulated sum of everything they owned, their home, their car, their you know whatever is in it, and income was growing faster than was the top five percent. The top 5% was still doing fine, but they were actually not getting richer as fast as the middle class was. Reagan completely flipped that upside down when he dropped that top tax rate from the 74% that LBJ had set it at in 1967. He dropped it down to 25% and all hell broke loose. And then on top of that, you know, four years earlier, the Supreme Court had legalized political bribery in the Buckley case and then corporate bribery in the, in the Bellotti case in 76 and 78, as I mentioned. And that produced this, aval- this, this avalanche of money, this tsunami of money that helped bring Ronald Reagan to office in 1980 and continues to haunt us to this day. The court doubled down on that with Citizens United in 2010, um, unanimous among the conservatives, unanimously opposed by the, by the liberals on the court. You know, that's really interesting because obviously you're tying this back to a particular time and we've identified you've identified some of the tools. Um, is this a thing that, you know, I, I, I sort of vaguely remember the study that you referred to, the 2014 study. Is this a thing where we can see significant differences in how those things have affected the Republican Party as opposed to the Democratic Party? Or are we largely seeing similar trends on both sides? That's a brilliant question. And and the answer is 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 Really, rather remarkable. Um, in in 1976 and 78, when the Supreme Court said, "Okay, fine, uh, it's okay to own politicians," the Republican Party said, "Great, we'll take the money. Give us the rich people. Give us the corporations." You know, they'd always been kind of in bed with them, but it was more the Main Street, you know, businesses. In fact, Republicans used to refer to them as Main Street politicians uh, to themselves. Um, but the GOP said, "Okay, we'll take all this money," and like I said, that brought Reagan into power. The Democratic Party ignored it. Um, and the reason why is because at that point in time, a third of American workers were unionized. And through their union dues, American working people were supporting the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party was awash in cash in 1976, 78. Um, and it was almost all union cash. In fact, there was so much union cash that a few corrupt union officials like Frank Fitzsimmons and Jimmy Hoffa were able to siphon it off. Hoffa used some of that to bribe Richard Nixon. <laughs> so. Uh, Reagan's first job when he became president in, in 1981 was to destroy the funding source for the Democratic Party. His animus against unions, you know, I mean, this is a guy who used to be the president of SAG, you know, of, of the Actors Union. He didn't have a specific animus against unions themselves, but unions were what funded the Democratic Party. And so Reagan set out to destroy that. He, his first target was PATCO. He took them down in one week. In, in 1981, in August of 1981. And then you know he generalized that and he put an anti-union guy in charge of the Department of Labor, Ray Donovan. The Supreme Court went along with him with a couple of decisions. And so by 1992, the union money could no longer support a presidential campaign for, Demo- for a Democrat. And so Bill Clinton and Al Fromm got together and created this thing called the DLC, the Democratic Leadership Council, as basically a vehicle to bring money from billionaires and corporations into the Democratic Party. And and you know the compromise that they made was, okay, we've got to go to these people to get this money, but we'll leave the dirty industries to the Republicans. They can be funded by steel and oil and coal and and you know nuclear waste and stuff like that. We're going to take the clean industries. We'll take insurance. We'll take banking. We'll take tech, and <laughs> you know, and we'll clean this way, right? <laughs> and and you know, Clinton basically sold out the soul of the Democratic Party. But the truth is that Reagan had put him in a position where he had no choice, and uh, arguably, because they're, I mean, they didn't have the ability to crowdsource money now. So now, what Obama proved, and Hillary Clinton proved, and Bernie Sanders in particular proved, and and now Joe Biden doubled down on and proved again is that working people can once again fund a political party. And so now, thank God, about half of the Democratic Party are now in the Progressive Caucus and have now committed to not being taking 
you know, giant PAC money uh, donations from billionaires and giant corporations. And the other half of the Democratic Party is quickly trying to catch up, you know, learning the lesson of Joe Crowley versus Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. So I'm quite optimistic, actually, about the future of both the Democratic Party and the possibility that we can go back to some of those reforms of the 70s that followed in the wake of the Nixon bribery scandals that the Supreme Court blew up in 76 and 78. There are ways around Citizens United, but they require congressional action. Well, that's certainly one of the areas we're going to be watching for. Um, one thing I'm curious about is I, I get the rich wanting to buy politicians and getting the legislation they want to pass. I, I get the politicians liking getting this big money so that they can secure reelection, all that. Um, but you still need people to vote for you. And if, you know, as you point out in the study, you know, people aren't getting what they want, and we we always hear about how so many people are being left behind and all of that. How do the parties that are like that, that are part of this trend? How do you continue to get people to vote for you? How do you hide or obscure the fact that the policy outcomes are only geared towards the extremely wealthy? How do they do that over the past 30 years or so? Well, for the Republican Party, what they've been doing is, you know, with a wink and a nod, saying, yeah, we're here for tax cuts for rich people and to deregulate corporations. We'll just tell you that right up front. We think that doing that is somehow going to help the average person. And some people go along with that. But mostly what the Republicans have been saying is, hey, you white supremacists and race, you know, racists out there, come on in. We'll do your bidding, you know, and, and Trump, you know, just starts his opens his campaign with a racial slur against Hispanics. Um, they, uh, you know, oh, you don't, you know, you don't like brown people coming in the United States from south of here. We're going to build a wall. Um, you know, basically they just doubled down on on hate, on hate, on fear and hate of black people, of brown people, of gay people. Uh, you know, or non, you know, non-straight people, shall we say, more generally, including trans people and others. Um, they just doubled down on this, and and they reached out to these kind of micro groups, the anti-abortion freaks, the gun freaks, and 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 built a coalition of haters and fearers. And so the Republican Party is continuing to give to their base what they want, which is that stuff, hate. The Democratic Party got sucker punched. Uh, Obama came into office. I, you know, we we dealt with Clinton. Okay, <laughs> Clinton basically <laughs> governed as a Republican. Um, Obama came into office with great hopes. You know, he was uh, he was he he had campaigned on on you know at least the public option. He had earlier actually campaigned on on single payer. He thought he was going to get big things done, but he really wanted it to be bipartisan. And so he made all these compromises in the in the first bill, the first big piece of legislation, which was the bailout bill. You know, after the, the debris of George W. Bush's presidency, um, he cut that in half and and turned it from you know a, a trillion dollars, trillion and a half dollars of relief into nine hundred billion dollars and three hundred billion of it was tax cuts, all to satisfy the Republicans. And what did he get out of that? Three Republican votes. With Obamacare, he he made all kinds of compromises. He organized it around giant corporations, all this stuff that he hadn't set out to do. And he did it all to get Republican votes. And the Republicans kept telling him, oh yeah, yeah, no problem. Just you know, do this and do that and we'll vote for you. And then when it came time to vote, not one Republican vote for Obamacare, which was you know just hacked to death to get those Republican votes. And and then he lost, you know, he lost the control of Congress, and so the rest of his administration was basically, you know, running in place. There was very yeah. little he could do. Yeah, you know, right down to proposing, he went to to a Republican senator, Orrin Hatch, the senator from Utah, and said, "Who should I appoint to the Supreme Court?" And Hatch said, "Well, there's this Republican who's kind of a moderate guy, you know, Merrick Garland, but you know, he's he's acceptable to us. Why don't you put him in?" So Obama again trying to bow to the Republican said, "Okay, how about Merrick Garland?" And Mitch McConnell said, "Hey, screw you, buddy." <laughs> and and uh, so I, I, you know, Joe Biden saw that he had a front row seat to all that. And uh, you know, I, I think as George W. Bush said, "Fool me once, uh, don't get fooled again." <laughs> sort of. That that's cleaner than even his version. Um, so <laughs> you sketched out a possible path for the Democrats to try to break this cycle a little bit on their side. Well, um, what about North what about the Republicans? Well, I'm sorry. Start ignoring Republicans. Exactly. Well, that's true. In terms of the the hold that you know these donations, the new system of campaign finance set up as a result of some multiple Supreme Court decisions, what what path forward do you see for the Republican Party? Are they likely to change, and if so, how? 
the Republican Party is at a turning point right now because they they elevated a man to the White House who was an open fascist and racist. And there are there are many people in the Republican Party, perhaps a majority of the federally elected officials, and in many states, the majority of the state elected officials, who themselves are relatively open about being racists and fascists. There are other people in the Republican Party, Kitzinger, I think is his name, you know, the Republican from Illinois in the House of Representatives who voted to impeach Donald Trump and is being rather outspoken about this, who actually don't believe in racism and fascism. They just want Dwight Eisenhower's Republican Party, my dad's Republican Party, which was, yes, we're all in favor of social change. Let's just do it carefully, slowly, thoughtfully. We don't want to disrupt society. Um, you know, I, I didn't agree with that on that back in the day, and I don't <laughs> agree with those Republicans now. But but at least they're not poison, right? They're they're not crazy, and uh, the Republican Party is going to have to deal with this, and and uh, I don't know which way they're going to go. Mm-hmm. Okay, I have high of my own fears. A um, couple different paths, none of them particularly bright. Um, I I do have one last question though, and this is zooming out from this last book. Um, This is a question my producer really wanted to get to the bottom of. And I'm curious too, as someone who um, I host a show like you do, I'm trying to do some writing. Um, How do you get so much done? Because you've been on to talk about multiple books in not that long of a time. What is is your schedule like? How are you this productive? I don't have a life. Um, (laughs) My schedule schedule is pretty straightforward. Uh, Louise and I get up at five in the morning and uh, you know, we have a conversation about what we're going to do on the show that day. And we organize the show and we take one big topic that's going to be the main rant for the first hour. And I spend about an hour between 5.30 and 6.30 writing an op-ed about that that I publish over at tomharvin.medium.com every day. And then that rant becomes the, the center for the first hour. And then we have guests or whatever we have for the rest of the day. I get off the air at noon, have a quick lunch. And uh, Louise and I will often take a, a mile or two walk. And then from one o'clock until six o'clock, I write. I just sit down and write. It's just a matter of self-discipline. I do it every single day, Monday through Friday. And then on the weekends, I try to do it for six or seven hours each day. And uh, then we knock off at six. You know, I watch a little TV. We watch, you know, uh, dumb stuff to entertain ourselves. The Golden Girls <laughs> reruns or whatever. And, and we go to bed around. Show. Uh, go to bed around eight thirty or nine. And get up at five the next morning. And and uh, you know, it works for us. I can I can write two books a year and, and an op-ed every single day, and do a show in the context of that. And um, actually, the COVID over the last year has kind of helped me because. I'm not running off to have lunch with my kids and things like that. We talk to them on the phone, obviously, and things, but we just, yeah. I haven't you know, been outside of my own home since, since March 7th of last year, yeah. March 10th. Uh, it's been some year, um, yeah. but we appreciate your productivity. And uh, anyone watching this that'd like to find out a lot more about this process, the book is The Hidden History of American Oligarchy, Reclaiming Our Democracy from the Ruling Class. As always, Tom Hartman, we appreciate you taking time out to join us. John, as always, I'm honored and and very happy to be on your program. Thanks so much for the invitation. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.